Thank you for being here. A warm welcome from my side to some thoughts and showcases about the Internet of Things. What I'm going to talk about, let me see where I'm standing best, that I give you a good view. It's about the rise of computational power, robotics, further technologies, which will shape, which will change, which will transform the world. And I picked out some driving forces, some leading outcomes, let's say, Internet of Things, the machines approach humans, so-called Cyber World 2.0, that's the name invented by me, and superintelligence. And the question is, to what extent will these drivers, these technologies, these outcomes change the world? What are the transformations? Some thoughts. Let me start with some thoughts. And for the thoughts, it's more or less a little bit the history, the history of development of computational usage, the interaction of humans with computers. And on the next slide, I have many figures, pictures, and I will stay several minutes on the next slide to go with you through the history of development of the interaction humans and computers and how the business adapted these changes. We have some driving forces, we have some leading outcomes. But let me start, it's quite up in the top, human and computer. In the middle of last century, computers were rising. Computers in companies, later on in the 70s, computers at home, personal computers, and humans were interacting with these computers. What was it? At the beginning it was about, it's a small written, by that I give you all what's written here. It was about data, information, out of data, information and knowledge were made, were built up. Data warehousing were used to store the data, databases, how to bring the data there, how to store it, how to get it back. Knowledge management was on the other end. The knowledge in the brains of the humans and employees, how can this be used, how can this be uh, given from one person leaving company to another person, for example. Then the research was going in the direction, okay, if we have data warehousing and we know there's a lot of uh, knowledge in the humans' brains, we have some special, special type of data, records, files, <coughs> in the record management, how to best store these data, giving them keywords and retrieving the data. To do all this, some information systems are needed, some software together with the hardware. Here, CRM, customer relation management, but mostly it was enterprise resource planning systems, software that the enterprises are using to know what is their current state of sales, of income, of revenues, and whatever. Having these, and looking at the universities, what we are doing, what others are doing, okay, it's not only a beginning and the end, these are more processes. Where are steps in between, there are persons involved, and having these processes to deal with the data to make, to make, to make the best out of it, preferably we would have some workflows to automatize this. And the computers are not standalone. The computers were plugged to the internet, to the World Wide Web, to access data, to provide data there. Then to run all these, we need some project management, and this is taught at, at universities as well. <coughs> the students know, okay, we have some projects, uh, set up data warehouses, identify the processes, uh, optimize the processes, and so on. And finally, because I'm talking about humans and computers, we need some interfaces. The programming is behind. The interfaces are more the web design. That was more or less the only interface we had between humans and computers. Um, the screen, the keyboard is missing, and the mouse is missing. The companies identified, oh, that's wonderful. We have all these technologies, processes, systems here. Let's make money. And then we have the application area of e-business. The company said, okay, in the enterprise, we can use all the electronic means and um, optimize the data flow, the information flow within our enterprise, but better between enterprises. And in the 90s of last century, 
the B2B, the business to business was arising with a suppliers, customers, the companies somewhere in the middle, hopefully in the middle, and they are all managing these electronic data flow. To consumers as well, that was the B2C direction, the, computers, uh, the consumers were buying via web shops, that's fine. That was approaching us yeah, in the end of last century. The government by itself identified, oh, that's a wonderful technology, let's uh, use it. The, our citizens can vote, our citizens can fill out the text declaration electronically, all is running fine. What does it mean, all is running fine? The companies by itself need the IT strategy and IT management to maintain all this, to set the focus, to find out, okay, here we have to buy, here we have to invest. And for sure the IT security is an issue we do not have to neglect. More or less hand in hand or close to IT security is the information ethics. We have so many data information, personal data information. Who is allowed to use this? Is it allowed to use it for marketing reasons or not? And to bring some new ideas in it, we need some information management, technology management. And that's more or less what we were doing till 2005, 6, 7, 2003. Why? Then a game player or two game players came in charge. That's a little bit smartphone, that's the most upper world. It was changing, now the computing device is with me. You have your smartphone in your pocket, you have your computing device with you. In the past it was somewhere in your office, in your house. That increases the mobility and the web 2.0 uh, was changing. You're not consuming anymore what's in the internet, you're providing information to the internet. That's for sure collaboration, collaboration between private persons, between companies, between the consumers and the companies, whomever. The social media, that's the outcome or that's the result in all the collaboration using these technologies, systems, software, ideas here. Now it's more that the people around the world on the private life are connecting, the companies are using Facebook for marketing and so on. Here, it was the way that mobile commerce was appearing. Now you can do your e-banking with your smartphone in your pocket. You do not have to go to a stationary computer at home. You can do it wherever you want. You can buy wherever you want. And what does it mean wherever you want? You're tracked wherever you are with the location-based services, the smartphone, the IT, uh, the telecom providers know where your smartphone is and with this information it can be used to make money. To run all this we have in the background the cloud computing. You do not know anymore where your data are, you do not know where you are retrieving software from. You are getting, just getting this, you are consuming it, you have your mobile device, it's running in the background as well on the side of uh, software, the software is improving, you have better technologies in decision making, some possible alternatives are pre-processed and provided to you and you can say okay I order this or personalized you're getting some offers, Amazon is saying the other customers bought this, yes you can go this way, that's all possible here. New business models are rising. We know the big IT companies we have uh, from Amazon, from Uber, whatever, they are using what's there as a basis for their new business models. Companies identifying risks and to handle the risks we have the direction of governance risk compliance, hopefully in the extension with uh, information ethics we are able to maintain this. That's great. We are here. That's about the line 2015. And now, what was coming? What is coming? We have computational power. That's the most upper word. 
The computational power is increasingly dramatically and we are, uh, we are getting new technologies, for example, 3D printing. Some new technologies, you think 3D printing, okay, does it fit here? Yeah, probably it fits here because it will change the entire supply chain. The supply chain, we are not forced to deliver so many goods around. Here, we are mobile in ordering something and with 3D printing, we are maybe very localized to get the products. We print just our products. We print our hamburger, we print our t-shirt in the morning by putting the clothes on the day before just in a bin. You put it in, you press a button, I want a green t-shirt with this photo on it and uh, it's printed out in the morning and I put it over. That will come. And we have the robotics. In the robotics, it's a big, 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 tremendous game changer. Why? It's not that we have some metal, human-like machines. The game changing comes, the robots approach us. Here, computer were stationary. We had to go to the computer. Here, with the mobile, we are carrying the computers with us. With the robotics, even if I want or not, the robot is coming to me. And that's fully changing the possibilities we had here in the past. What's coming? And <laughs> that's the title of the presentation here. With the Internet of Things, everything is connected. Every device which needs electronic power will be connected to the Internet and theoretically knows about every other device in the world. Uh, in Europe, I do not know if in the US we have the word Industry 4.0. That's more for the producing companies. There, every producing machine is already connected to the internet or shall be connected to the internet and uh, say, in three weeks, I need maintenance. Please send me someone. That's already working in the producing industry. What's coming as well? I call it another leading outcome. That's autonomous. The machine approaches the humans. See it here with the robotics, they are coming. They are coming to me. They are entering the door. Ah, come in, no robot, okay. Next year, the robot will come. We have the self-driving cars. I'm standing outside, I need a car. The car is somehow identifying my need to go to the airport. It's coming uh, with a supply chain management. Some parcels are picked up by self-driving trucks or however. It's fully changing the supply chain. Maybe in healthcare with autonomous, that's nice. When I'm getting older, some healthcare robots are coming to me and saying, Rolf, don't worry, I carry you. Oh, that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> On the other hand, we have working and not flying, fighting machines. Working machines, the drones, the quadrocopters, I order pizza, what will come? The drone knocks on my window, I open the window, get the pizza in it, now it's charged, the drone is flying away, I have it here. No human interaction anymore while ordering a pizza with a pizza delivery service. Where will we see it first? Fighting machines. We will see the autonomous first in the next wars. It will come. Another leading outcome, that's Cyber 2.0. That's a word invented by me. I do not know if uh, it's already used. Let's say real versus virtual world. What do we have there? We have the virtual, the augmented reality. Virtual reality. You know you put on your glasses. Later on I have some showcases about it. You are in a virtual world, hopefully. But what's virtual versus real, blockchain, cryptocurrency. You have your credit card. On your credit card, your bank guarantees the state-guaranteed currency. You pay with US dollars, we pay with euros in Europe. In two years, we pay with a cryptocurrency, maybe not Bitcoin, something else. It's not guaranteed by any governmental institution, but it's valid, it will be accepted. The blockchain, the blockchain is guaranteeing that every contract is somehow distributed around the cloud computing in the world 
but no one can hack it, hopefully. Virtual. What is this? Well, virtual. Cyber robots, human augmentation. I'm standing here, in one hand I have a clicker, in the other hand I need the mouse, and then I'm identifying, okay, my smartphone is ringing, I need a third arm. That's human augmentation. I go to the doctor and I'm getting a robotic third arm. That will come. We have the heart, I don't know the English word, uh, if your heart is a little bit weak, you have a machine to... The pacemaker. We will have it for everything. The brain maker, maybe, to give you, to stimulate your brain. Third arm, four legs, or whatever. That will come. That's the kind of the virtual world we will have. And super intelligence, more intelligent than humans. We have such an increase or renaissance of artificial intelligence, an increase in methods, in computational power used in these methods, in artificial and computational intelligence to make the machines more intelligent, to let them compute, maybe let them think faster than humans. What extent will this have? We don't know. We don't know. And last but not least, ethics of the machine. I'm running out of the slides. I do not know what to put pictures here. Maybe we can discuss later on. How can we deal with this sequence? I leave this slide for, for the moment. To remember you in this slide, I will come back in 10 minutes and show this entire picture again. I pick out some certain aspects I want to share with you. One is, just quickly summarizing, we have, we had some driving forces, uh, starting with uh, human computers, then um, 10, 15 years ago, the smartphone, the web 2.0, the mobility was increasing, the computational power is still increasing and will increase. Uh, new technologies are coming. I was mentioning 3D printing, but there are more in the pipeline. We do not already identify that they will contribute here. The robotics, we don't know what's coming, and the three dots, we even do not know what's coming else. The leading outcomes, at the beginning it was about data information, then it was e-business. Here, the Internet of Things, you can say maybe it's a driving force. Or the Internet of Things, that's the outcome that uh, you're using Bluetooth or whatever near field communication technologies to connect all the de uh, devices. Everything is connected. Autonomous, the machine will approach the humans. Cyber 2.0, real versus virtual world, super intelligence, more intelligent than humans and ethics of the machines, and maybe more and more. So, what are we doing at our universities? I do not know the future. You don't know the future. Our students don't know the future. We can pick out certain technologies, certain outcomes, and try to combine these, and let uh, the students doing research about it. And here I'm talking more about showcases. It's not a research that they have hundreds of publications about it. It's more to find out what's possible in this sequence. How can we combine different, different things and think about it? How can we combine different, different things? The Internet of Things, let's take this picture and say everything is connected. Yeah, that's for sure. In the Internet of Things, one paradigm is everything is connected. But probably the Internet of Things is a driving force for the autonomous, for the machine approaches the humans. The machines are connected. The machines are connected to the Internet. We, not we, the servers or the internet. The internet knows where the machines are with all the location-based services, GPS, and whatever. The cyber 2.0, real versus virtual world. It starts with the cloud computing. On one hand, cloud computing is real. On the other hand, it's virtual. You don't know where your data are. You don't know what happens with your data. You don't know how you are tracked in the cloud 
or whatever happens in the cloud. And that's the issue for cybersecurity. Here we have it as well. That's the way we try to somehow get track of our data, what happens in the cloud with our, our data. The super intelligence, the decision making, it's only one start to get personalized product propositions. You should order these products. That's one way of super intelligence. But the super intelligence is more. Within the next years, we will have that one computer has the same capability as a human brain. At the moment, humans are good in creativity, in empathy, uh, maybe in designing, in composing music or whatever. We don't know if the computational power of our brain, if we can get the same computational power of the computer, if the computer can do the same. But it will increase. Within this century, we will have a computer which has the computational power of all the brains of all humans in the world. What happens then? So let's pick out some showcases what we are doing. With our students, you can buy devices, a smartwatch, uh, Google Project Tango, that's a device um, for indoor navigation, the drones, gesture control systems, the Kinect, from uh, Microsoft Kinect to identify my movement, my body movements, 3D glasses. And we say, OK, mostly they are designed and sold for fun. People buy it. It makes fun to fly a drone. It makes fun to play a computer game. But there's probably more behind. Can we use these? technologies and think a little bit of combining them, what are the benefits in certain areas? Virtual reality, gesture control, motion tracking. Um, you take a virtual reality headset, a motion controller, for example, the leap motion, you can put it on it or in front of you and it's tracking your hands while you're watching there around, or the Microsoft Kinect or another motion controller tracking your entire body. And you can combine these technologies. And it's starting, I would have a video here, but maybe in the Q&A session we have a little bit of time to show it. It's starting, these technologies, is everyone able to use it? And we were testing with a young researcher. She's in my institute, or she was in my institute compared to colleague of the age, of the same age as I am. And as you think of, or as you might know, the younger ones, the digital natives, are saying, oh, that's great, um, business ideas, business models using these devices, I'm looking forward to have these. The older generations are saying, oh, what can we do with virtual reality that's more in the game area? Yeah, but there's an immersive feeling. You're in feeling on a, being in a game if you put on these virtual reality glasses, but you can add additionally sound, vibration, motion, wind. And one example, one showcase I had that was really impressive to me, uh, or you can use voice commands to steer it. It was one example really impressive to me it was one and a half year ago, that's me, sitting on a motor bike in a fair. It was a company fair about uh, new technologies. And they put, they gave me the virtual reality glasses, put uh, headphones on it. I was sitting on the motorbike. The motorbike was able to swing, not to drive. But I had a fan in front of me and a backpack which could vibrate. And I was saying, OK, they are staring dozens at, uh, of people at me. I'm sitting here in the hall, and now a movie is running in 3D. That's fine, that's fine. But after 30 seconds, I was fully in this video. It was a motorbike race, and I was overtaking other motorbikes, and I was trying not to, not to fall off this motorbike because it was swinging. And it, 
lasted about one minute, one and a half minute. And afterwards, I was really ready to sign the contract to buy this motorbike. It, I couldn't buy it. But uh, this technology is what I was to, uh, what I'm about to say. We are thinking we are too old for these technologies. We are too logic. Uh, we can say, yeah, these are technologies. They cannot influence me. They can influence you. It's only a way or question how to combine these technologies to bring you an immersive feeling. So, quickly running over other examples. You machine interfaces, body attached sensors. Um, this is a ball about the size of a billiard ball, but there are electronic motors, engines in it, and you can let it run on the ground and either you have your smartphone in the hand and by moving your smartphone, you can run this ball on the ground. You pay, I don't know, 120 US dollars for this and it's more or less, yeah, it's fun. Several minutes and afterwards you're saying, okay, well, not really interesting. You combine it, can combine it with the gesture control system and uh, this you put around your arm and it's identifying how you're contracting your muscles in the arm. You can wear it beyond your jacket and you combine these technologies uh, together and by learning the system or training the system which contraction is which movement, you can let your, the ball run around. And maybe that's a ball. You can exchange this ball to your car. You can sit in the back of your car and only by moving your arm and to train the system you can steer a car. Or you can control a drone flying outside around. You can be a terrorist and saying, let the drone fly over there only by raising your arm and doing this. There's so much possibilities, danger, opportunities, threats behind these technologies. We often do not realize it because you see these technologies, you buy these for probably 100 US dollars. You buy it in an electronic store Maybe your kids have these technologies and you're saying, okay, but it's not really interesting. That's for fun. There's so much beyond this fun as business opportunities or other opportunities using these technologies. Um, what's quite open is the cognitive controllers to put it on your head. It's not so interesting if you walk around in the city and have this on your head but it will, in the process of minimization, you will have certain minimal dots, points on your head and your brain waves are somehow, or you are able with your brain waves to control something. You do not need any devices in this size anymore to contract your muscles. You can just think, let the ball roll to the right to the left or whatever, that will come. I don't know what possibilities we have then and what opportunities and threats we have. In the sense of minimization, you know the computational power which you had in the past with your laptops, you have actually with your smartphones, you will have it in your smart watches. We don't know. If this will be disruptive technology or is it just a minimization process of some devices and together fusioning with uh, watches you were wearing, the mechanical ones, the old ones. Maybe it might be more a controlling device as used here. What smart watches are valuable or we are doing research with smart watches they can be tracked. They have all the <coughs> GPS, the VLAN uh, wireless tracking in it. It's known where the persons are only by using these smart watches. Here we are more or less ready to know, okay, I can switch off all my 
GPS and uh, the devices to, uh, or the software to deliver data to Google. This is a new threat in the sense we are not thinking so much with the smartwatches. As far as we were realizing it's, oh, now I have it as a smartwatch and the security issues are often forgotten with smartwatches. With the tracking, another idea, this was a research project, that's, that's me, that's uh, one of my research assistants, and you see we have some tracking devices here. Now we're coming to the good side. What, what's possible with these tracking devices? In the field of ambient assisted living, um, it's much healthcare done in Europe, and mainly the old persons have to fill out paper-based healthcare um, sheets where the health care takers are asking the older persons, have you drank sufficiently over the day? Um, have you walked several steps but not taken the staircase? Um, uh, have you smoked? And all the people say, no, no, I have never smoked, no, uh, not drunk alcohol, I walked sufficiently but uh, not on the stairs and whatever. They lied. They, they lied. <laughs> uh, and we were trying to use tracking mechanisms, and that was the Arduino physical platform. Um, it's about this size, today it's about this size. And uh, what's the min minimal set of sensors you can attach in the homes of the elderly people or on the body of the elderly people to get a real measurement, but not too intrusive to their life, to, say, uh, to see have they really smoked? Smoking is probably easy to identify, but have they drank sufficiently but not alcohol? Um, yeah, and we were testing these devices. That's another way of using internet of things, connect everything, and the persons are connected. We have to see if this is nice. What will come? We are doing a little bit research or building showcases in the field of robots and navigation. And the question is, oh, the robots, our institute is not rich, therefore we are using the Lego robots. You can just build your hardware how you want. And we attach some devices, for example, the Google Tango tablet. It's the size, the standard size of a tablet, about this size. And Google was um, introducing this device about one and a half year ago. And this device had, has additional software on it to identify indoor locations by just measuring a 3D room and identifying where tables are, where the floor is, where the ceiling is, and some lamps in it. And with augmented reality, you can pose some objects somewhere virtually, and when you walk around with this 3D tablet, you see the objects you have virtually placed, and it will stay, and you can give the tablet to someone else. And that's because a certain set of sensors I is in it, and it was, or it is a Google showcase, but it's not so often or rarely combined with robots. And the robots are getting the ability to navigate in rooms without GPS. GPS is not working in rooms and maybe without a wireless identification with a wireless antenna, uh, you can position objects quite well. When you switch off all these possibilities and using only optical sensors, the robots are still able to perform task with a wonderful accuracy. And this is a new way of bringing intelligence to the robots. And you can extend this to drones, let the drones fly indoors without crashing with people, with walls, and so on. For sure, Internet of Things guarantees the connection to all. So. Extremely interesting, but we'll have to cut it <laughs> okay, the last thoughts to the one minute left. And this is coming back to my introductory 
slide with all the timeline going on and in the mid of last century 70s these technologies were starting to rise till about the year 2005 there was only incremental improvement. Then something happened with the smartphone, the mobility, the web 2.0. There was a leap in the direction of uh, mobile commerce, cloud computing, location-based services. About two years ago, we had a new leap with the rise of the Internet of Things. We are now talking of the Internet of Things. It started somewhere here, but we are now talking it, about it. We are talking about autonomous. We are talking about cyber 2.0, super intelligence, more intelligence than the machines. The question is, what is the next big leap? I don't know. I don't know. 